families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Families Divided TV. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your faithfulness. And we hope that if you haven't subscribed, you'll subscribe, click on the subscribe button. And if you have not clicked on the bell to be notified of uh, our episodes, you may want to do that because we do put a lot of things on here weekly and you'll be first up to be notified when we do. Our videos are here to help both the alienated family members as well as the professionals. We do hope we're making a difference in your lives and, and helping you uh, get through this hell on earth called alienation. And also as a professional to help you to understand things to help those alienated family members. We're grateful to our presenters here tonight and on all the things that they do. So thanks again to all of you. In tonight's episode, attorney Jeremy Tanner is going to be sharing with us his personal story some on the high conflict divorce. He's also going to be giving us tips on um, how to cope with this, how to get through it. And actually, young men and young women on how to get prepared for marriage. So this is a good episode. And I hope you'll all take notes and be an avid listener to it as well. Again, we thank you for being with us and God bless. And we're going to get to Jeremy Tanner right after these messages. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. And we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. All right, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, again, I'm Jeremy Tanner. I'm an attorney in Johnston County, North Carolina. I've been asked to speak on high conflict divorce, kind of intertwine my personal story into it because I have been through a high conflict divorce. It was about 10 years ago, but I'm going to try and intertwine uh, my story into that without giving a whole lot of information because there's always more to it than you can say in a short little video. But I also want to talk to you about what it is and, and give some advice at the end. But I know most of you watch these videos and go to these channels because you've either been through a divorce or you have a, a family member who's been through a divorce and maybe you don't get to see your kids. Maybe you don't get to see your grandkids. But what I tell everybody is, because I've gone through it and my mother, who I will talk about, has gone through it. Um, don't stop fighting. Don't give up. Always try and see your kids. Always try and see your grandkids because every kid needs a mother and father. And if one's missing, that kid's at a huge disadvantage. And obviously, grandparents can have a highly influential role in children's lives, which I'm going to talk about because my own mother, luckily, um, through my experience, now gets to see her grandkids regularly, and her being the smart person that she is, she's taught them a lot. So as you get the information, don't always say, oh, well, there's nothing I can do. Try to get it and fight and, and stay in your kids' lives, but also understand the process because the process is really geared towards the woman. And as a man who went through it kind of blindsided, even though I was the one that left the marriage, not knowing the law, which is sad because I'm a, a 20 plus year lawyer and I'd never done anything in divorce. Uh, you, you learn the law really quickly and you learn the 
intricacies and the end result is you want to go, well, how can I fix it? And how can I make it better for young men who, in my opinion, despite my bad experience, still need to get married, still need to try and have a family, but they need to go in it in, in, a, in an educated way. Because if that's something you want to do, as I did through my parents' experience, you should try to do it. Whereas if you don't ever want kids, the advice I tell everyone is never get married. And if you live in a state where cohabitation uh, is part of the law, don't put yourself in a situation where if the relationship ends, you can be on the hook financially to someone. So let's let's kind of get started on it um, just to give you a, a little background on myself, because we're going to talk about high conflict divorce, what causes it, um, how it can destroy the people involved in it, their family members and cost you a whole lot of money over things that should be resolved and it shouldn't be kind of high conflict. But the sad reality is as the law sits, it is. So like I mentioned earlier, um, I practice law in Johnston County, North Carolina. I've been doing it for, I guess, 28 years now. Um, I have my own practice, so I work for myself so I can kind of control the cases that I handle. Um, when I first started working, I was basically a personal injury lawyer. I've done that. I still do that. And that is my main area of practice. But I had been a lawyer almost 20 years when my divorce happened and I knew nothing uh, about divorce law. I didn't deal with divorce lawyers. I didn't go to court for divorce. And I kind of always assumed that people who got divorced were poor people and celebrities and people that weren't raised right. Um, and that was kind of a, a blind thing because I had my life experience, which uh, was my parents. Um, obviously, I'm a, a child of the 70s. My parents got married young in their early 20s. My father was a Navy guy. My mom tried to finish college, but meets my dad and they decide to get married. And, and my dad being Navy, I'm born and raised San Diego, California. So you're there. You have your house. Um, after I was born, I had a sister born two years later. So you have mother, father, sister, brother living in a house. Um, we each had our own room nothing fancy. We weren't rich by any means. And probably if you could look back and understand what your parents were dealing with, we were probably on the, the low end of, of uh, money-wise living. So we weren't poor. We weren't scraping for food, but we weren't eating out all the time. We didn't have luxury items. And my dad drove a, an old gremlin that had a, a floor in the bottom of it, but his eight track player worked and we could pop in those Eagles eight tracks and and we had all that 70s rock music blasting as he drove us to school or mom drove us to school. But we knew that when school got out, mom was there to get us and we'd come home. We did our homework. We played our sports and dad would come home from his nine to five job and everybody talked and enjoyed things. Dad did our sports and just what a normal family was or so we thought because all our friends were like that. So divorce was not part of, of your life. And yeah, it happened back then, but unlike now where, you know, divorce is so much more prevalent um, back then, you didn't think about it. You had your little circle of friends and everybody's mom and dad was together with rare exceptions and you grew up and you didn't know who had what and, and the, the families that had noticeably more, you would see it, but you didn't think about it because that wasn't most of your friends. But later on in life, you realize how bad your parents struggled to keep the family together and make sure everything was paid. And you learn that. But the one thing you didn't learn was, well, how do you navigate relationships? How do you, how do you handle, you know, meeting a girl and knowing if she's the right one for you? And, you know, what is, what is divorce? Why does it happen? And all those things that you wouldn't think of because your parents didn't experience it. It would be kind of a, a, a faux pas, conversation because you're raised in a Christian household, you go to church every Sunday, you have conservative values, you don't get divorced. So it's not part of your conversation. So as a young man growing up, uh, I didn't get that conversation from my mother or my father. Um, you go to college and of course, like many of us, you, you meet a girl and you fall head and heels over love and you learn what it is and you learn how people manipulate each other and how you treat each other and you know, I didn't get married to her, but then you go to school and you get out and you get your law degree, you start working and you're dating and you're doing all these things. But um, you're now in this generation where kids are getting married, kids are getting divorced a lot more easily. 
and you don't know how to navigate it. And you go in and as a man, you realize you're going to lose at least half your stuff and you're going to probably lose access to your children. 50% is not assumed. Even if you've done nothing wrong, you just didn't get along with your spouse and you get broken apart. So you get that kick in the teeth when you least expect it. So that leads to often a high conflict divorce, which in modern times now is a lot more prevalent than it ever was back then when our parents were married. And even the people that got divorced, they do it quietly, divide the money up, and you'd still wonder who's paying who, how are the kids getting their money so they can live. But now high conflict divorce is everywhere. And what causes it and what seems to cause it is uh, fighting over money or fighting over children. Um, you know, I think it's, and I'm probably one of these people, but it's kind of a dying breed where, you know, you learn from your father that the man, you get married, the man takes care of the family household, works hard as he can, pays all the bills. The wife stays at home, raises the kids. If she wants to get a part-time job or even a full-time job later as they grow up, great. But your, your initial belief system, and you hope to be on the same page with your spouse is, Man works hard, man earns the money, wife stays at home, raises the kids. So the end result of that, and, and with divorce being there and the inequities being there, you have a man who's often earning a lot of money, wife staying at home. Maybe she's not doing what she should. She's not keeping the house clean. Whatever it is, it's going to make the man upset. And you have a lot of resentment and a lot of things going on. And then when you split up, there's a lot of anger because on one side, the man wonders, okay, I've worked and worked and earned and the wife's not pulling her weight. And then the wife's going to go, well, I'm at home taking care of these kids. Maybe I've given up a career uh, and I'm really mad that we're getting a divorce. So in my situation, uh, I go through law school, start a business, build it up. And then I get married. I'm 35 years old. So I waited too long to get married. For whatever reason. I mean, obviously, you just don't pick someone right off the bat and say, I want to marry him. But um, my person or my situation or my maturity level didn't come into play until I'm 35 years old. So at 35, you know, you're paying back your school loans, you're trying to build a business, you've got all this money into things, and you're trying to get it to grow. And you have a house that you you've bought, and you meet a woman. And, and I will say that I thought I'd hit the jackpot. And to this day is someone who I filed the divorce, which is rare because women usually file 80% of them. I didn't want to get divorced and I didn't want to break up my family, but you see what's going on and you start to get educated. So while you're there working hard, taking care of your family and you're not knowing what you're doing is you save every dime you make and you pay everybody's bills and you're in this house that, you, that you're paying for and you're not getting any financial contribution from a college educated person who's with you in your home, um, you're learning real quick what's going on. And when things happen that make you go, okay, here's, here's a divorce that's gonna take place and how it takes place and why it takes place, that's another conversation. And I certainly don't do these meetings or videos to, to bash an ex-wife, but here you are, you get married at 35, you have a, a she's pregnant the first month, you have this beautiful baby daughter. I mean, just everything I'd ever wanted and everything I was so thankful for, married to this beautiful woman who, if I could design a woman physically, it would be her. If I could walk home and say, here's the mother of my kids and how she looks and how it appears, that's her. So I feel like I'm the luckiest man on earth. But as you get into it and you, you pull the wool back and you see what's going on, you now realize that the person you married probably didn't care a whole lot about you and maybe had an agenda, but you know the marriage isn't going to work and it's not going to last unless you're willing to tolerate a lot of things that you shouldn't have to tolerate. Uh, we have a second kid two years later. Um, and again, this 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 kid, just beautiful, beautiful, two beautiful, healthy daughters. We're both in our mid-30s, late 30s for me, but you're having children at a time where not only are you on the wrong side of 30 years old, and it's not necessarily the healthiest thing to do, but you know you're going to be parents of teenagers later in life. Um, you're, you're having kids while you're really making your money. And if the marriage is not going to go right, uh, it's going to be a high conflict divorce. And you're sitting there, you've got, I mean, these two daughters are just 
perfect. They're, they're physically perfect. You're raising them right. You are blessed beyond belief. And you feel like you can thank God every day that you have this family that came to you at a time when most people don't get it. Most people that are getting married in their, their thirties, mid thirties, especially they're, they're, they're either getting people that had been divorced before, which my wife had been married and divorced before she hadn't had any kids, but she had experience and often you're marrying people that have kids already. And, and that creates extra issues. But um, I felt like I had gotten very lucky to having wait until I was 35 or not having the maturity at 35 to get married and have kids and do all the things that the age my parents did when back in the day they would get married. You just made it work. You had your kids young, you were together you didn't have dating apps. You didn't have uh, a bunch of different people in front of you all day where you felt like you had temptations. You stayed married. You worked it out. You raised your kids, money or not, and the issues that we now face and Generation X and even younger kids, you're still working hard. You're trying to be successful, but then you get married. It's a big kick in the face when divorce happens more easily. And uh, as a lawyer, 20-year lawyer, you can say, well, I didn't know a single thing about divorce law, which is embarrassing, but your wife probably could pass a, a board-certified test to be a divorce lawyer, despite never having gone to law school a day in her life, because women know the divorce laws. They are up on it. They know. They are how they figure it out, where they get it. They know going in what the divorce laws are, and if there's an inequity they know that they can take your money away from you whenever you want to. So as the marriage went south and I finally got some legal advice because I realized I don't want to be divorced, but if this goes on and I continue to be successful, uh, the payout's going to be higher, but also we have young children. And if I was going to get divorced, I wanted to do it before they turned into teenagers and older, which my understanding would be the divorce would be harder on them. So you having to make real life decisions, which you don't want to make because I love my wife, most attractive woman in the world I'd ever seen. I didn't want to get divorced, but you also don't want to continue to be a, you know, a, a blue pill simp where you're making money, you're working hard, you're not getting reciprocation in a lot of ways from the wife. And she's just sitting there laughing at you to herself, knowing every day you're being a responsible man and you're making money for the family and you're saving it. That's more money she gets when she decides to leave you, which I think she would have eventually done because she didn't care about me. She just saw me as a guy who helped her recover from her first marriage and she wanted kids and she liked how I looked and could take care of everything and would make money. So I'm just the guy there at the time. You don't want to admit that because you just think you're the most wonderful man in the world, but you're not when there's so many other people for an attractive woman to be around whenever she wants to. So I go see a lawyer and I get educated and I, and I ask the lawyer and I say, well, now that I've told you the story and all that's going on, what would you do if you were advising her? And he says to me, he says, Jeremy, if I was your wife, I would stay right where I am because she's doing what she wants every day. Uh, she's not, you're not bothering her. She's not doing things she doesn't want to do because you've abandoned each other physically and emotionally. So until she figures out what she wants to do and you're making, you're saving money and you're allowing her to not have any financial responsibility and she doesn't have to really take care of the house, why would you leave? She's going to leave on her terms later. And that was the big, big awakening for me. So I make the decision at some point that, and, I, and again, after saying, honey, I don't want to get divorced. Can we try and figure it out? and asking for certain things that she just ignored. I knew I had to divorce her, so I left. And once you leave, you're now in high conflict divorce because you have two kids, two beautiful daughters. I think one was five, one was seven. And I assume I'm gonna get equal custody of my kids. We're gonna work out a schedule that allows me to see them um, and that she would go to work and start doing something. She had a college degree. Um, she could get a job. She was working before I met her. So you just you just work out what happens in a divorce. No, no divorce is conflict free. But when you get divorced, you hope that usually the dad doesn't want to be in the life or he takes off or he'll settle for every other weekend. And I wasn't that kind of father. I figured equal custody minimum. And, you know, she could have whatever day she wanted, 
not going to fight you on the holidays, but you want equal custody. So as soon as I leave, I get a letter from a lawyer that says, you can see your children two days a month and we want you to pay her ex. And you're like flabbergasted. And then you lawyer up and next five over the next five years, we have conflict over basically custody. I want equal custody. She refuses. Um, you deal with parental alienation of young daughters and you get real tastes of it. I remember the, the first time I saw my youngest daughter, she's barely five on a visit after I left. And she walks up to me and says, saying, hi, dad, how are you? She says, daddy's going to lose all his money. And you just look at her like, OK, there's the mom using the child to parent and it just breaks your heart. And now you're now in a high conflict divorce. Now, obviously, there's money issues because you feel like you earned money. You built something before uh, you married her. She didn't contribute to law school loan repayment. She didn't help me start my business. She didn't give up all the earning time so I could go to school. Real inequity. But you don't know anything about that when you're getting married. So you're you're getting married because all the reasons I mentioned before. But now you're in this conflict over money. And of course, you're paying child support, you're paying alimony. Um, so you don't want to pay those things, obviously, for a lot of reasons, but that's the way it is. And that's what's going to happen. But ultimately, the conflict comes over her not allowing me to have equal custody of the kids. So we're going to trial on that. So I live in a county where uh, the working man and the stay-at-home housewife, you walk into a courtroom, you can be father of the year, man of the year. You're not getting 50-50 custody of your kids. You're just not, especially when they're young. So um, without being able to get into what allowed me to get it and has nothing to do with me being a lawyer or knowing anybody, I ultimately won at trial 50% of my kids. Okay, So I get 50% custody and she's not happy. So that amps it up even more. Um, and I'm sure if you've ever been through it, you can have 50-50 custody of your kids, but you're still paying out money in child support, which complete, you know, and you're learning all this real quickly. You're going, okay, well, we each are responsible for kids. We're capable of working. Why do I have to pay you money and alimony for a certain period of time? Because we're not married anymore. And it's, it's, a, it's a totally new experience. So you're now learning divorce law. You're now learning all the mistakes you made and all the things you did wrong because you didn't have um, knowledge that you needed to have or awareness that you needed to have, which as someone who's educated and is un in the law, not to know that's almost embarrassing. So you're, you're getting a life lesson in a short period of time while you're paying out everything you've worked for. I mean, I, for example, I put money down on a house, made every single payment on it, took care of it. And by the time I was divorced and divided up the money, I no longer own my house. She owns my house free and clear. She never paid one penny on it. So as mad as I was about that, I'm learning, well, if I just stayed longer, the payout would be even bigger. So like if we're now 10 years later and we're getting divorced after 18 years of marriage versus eight, the money I'd be paying out would be insane. So I'm sitting there going, well, that's why she's not leaving because she didn't feel like I'd earned enough money for her yet. And she was going to do it on her own terms because that's how smart she was. She knew the divorce law. She could play the, the, the soft voice Marilyn Monroe housewife type, but this woman was smart, smarter than me. So when I get this advice from a lawyer and it kicks in, even after trying to say, I still don't want to get divorced, but realizing she didn't care, I filed for divorce. We're now in conflict over the kids and while you're going to court and you're not talking to each other and the kids are seeing it, all the dollars you've earned is being burned on lawyers. You're spending tons of money on them. So high conflict divorce or divorces that usually take a long time and somebody's spending a lot of money and who ends up having to pay the lawyer's fees and who paid what to their lawyer really doesn't matter. But a lot of money was spent, money that could be spent to send two daughters to college and money that would not have to have been spent had she agreed to give me equal custody of my kids. So the anger's there, the resentment's there, and you're mad at yourself for getting into a situation, but also not knowing the law, not understanding that this is how it works. Because people get divorced all the time, and it's never fun. But if you don't have a lot of money, or the dads aren't interested in equal custody, because even without custody, his child support isn't that much because he doesn't pay, he doesn't make that much. 
those divorces go a lot smoother, they go a lot quicker, and they often don't have lawyer costs because there's no money to pay the lawyers. But you get into high conflict divorces because one party won't allow equal access to the children, or there's anger over the inequality of the contribution to who gets what money. And, and by that is, in, in a lot of states, uh, you, you take the money that was earned while you were married and you divide it equally absent some kind of weird facts. And while there may or may not have been weird facts, I didn't feel that was fair and I didn't feel like that was appropriate in light of all the other things that I had done prior to getting married and her lack of financial contribution. Yet her mind is, well, I buried you two kids, gave up eight years of go going to work. I deserve half of what you earned after you earned it getting educated and building a business. So you're in conflict over that. But ultimately, that didn't hold up the settlement because I made the deal and paid her. Um, I didn't like it. And she got ridiculous money for what I believed was a short marriage and minimal contribution because just because you birth a couple of kids doesn't mean those kids are yours. And daughters need their fathers. And if you if you are involved in a relationship and you either have a daughter or you are a daughter and you don't have your father in your life, the statistics are clear that you have so many more disadvantages and you'll learn that really quick. So once all that happened, I now have equal custody of my daughters and we're still, you know, back and forth nitpicking and we don't speak to each other. We have to communicate by a computer program called Our Family Wizard, which if you've gone through a divorce, you probably know what it is. You have kids. And it's ridiculous because these are two adults, educated adults who know better, but there's conflict and there's anger and whatever it is, we can each talk about it. And when I do these talks and, and symposiums or question and answers about things, I don't like to bash an ex-wife, but you almost have to know the whole story to understand why there would be a lot of anger on my end. Because 10 years later, um, I still didn't want to get divorced. I'm still angry about it. Still find her the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. So glad that I had two kids with her, but not the wife that I was hoping to get, not the wife that my mother was to my father with a lot less and mad at society that the divorce laws are the way they are and that people now, especially young people, have access to so many things that cause them to cheat and, and not stay by their partner and discard their partner. And women who are pretty have even more of an advantage to do this because men want pretty women. And if you can get one and you prove to her that you're getting her by the things that you do, being a successful, strong man, she's got a gun to your head. And she's got a gun to your head until she wants to divorce you or until you wake up and realize it's not going down the path you want it to. And that's not good for either party. So you're now divorced and there's constant battles and battles, but we each have week on week off custody with our kids. And long story short, those kids decide they want to live with me uh, within a few years after the initial division. So um, I've now got basically full custody of my two daughters. They live with me every week. Yeah, they spend weekends every other weekend with their mom and time during the summer, but they are with me and they are taught by me and they are raised by me. I coach their sports teams. I have a good conversation with them. And we talk about things in ways that my ex-wife and I should have probably been better with each other in terms of talking about day-to-day -day things that we may not be happy with in terms of our relationship. So you learn that it's an important part of being married and it's important why you have high conflict divorces and what they do, because once you have one, not only do they destroy the kids, you now have to talk about the family members. And my only living family member is my mother. My father passed away um, right before I first was born from cancer. My younger sister died in a car wreck years ago. So it was just me and my mother. And um, my mother is very smart, very helpful, and was very involved in the kids' lives. Yet the ex-wife, who didn't want me to see my kids at all, didn't want my mother to see them, and said this openly in court, that she'd prefer the granddaughters not see the grandmother, it just breaks your heart. Because no matter what goes on between the mom and the dad, the kids need both parents, and the kids need to see their grandparents. So um, as I got equal custody and my mother raised them with me in a way that helps them get educated, gives them a different perspective, and gives them another person to talk to because maybe they felt like they couldn't talk to their mom. Maybe there were issues 
they had with their mother or things that happened that I'm not going to talk about because I don't want to bash the mom, but something makes you want to go live with one parent over the other. And they chose me because of what I bring to the table in terms of a man, a father, an example, and they have a more stable home. They have more ability to communicate. So those high conflict divorces are caused by inability to communicate, which leads to one party saying, I'm going to go. And then when you have a way that you can only get back at the opposite parent, which is taking the kids or holding the kids, you have parental alienation issues, you have a lot of money, and you have a lot of things that are that are happening that don't need to happen because the only people that suffer from it are the kids. And yeah, you suffer emotionally and financially, but you can earn the money back and you get angry that it will never come back because if you build a family with someone and someone you love, care about, or attracted to, um, and I would have had more kids if we could have, if it would have been later in life and we could have stayed together. That's how happy I was in what I thought was supposed to be a marriage. But when that doesn't work out, you're, you're changed for life. And, and once you get out, then you're teaching yourself, okay, what did I do wrong? What can I learn from it? How do I learn and how do I be better? Not only as maybe a partner to someone down the road, but also as a father and just as a person who deals with everybody on a day-to-day basis, because it's always bothered me as someone who is a helper, who I help people for a living. I take care of people. Um, I like to think I'm friendly. Uh, all the lawyers that know me, we get along. I don't have personal conflict with anybody. Yet the one person I couldn't get along with was the mother of my children. And not only do we not get along, we had a high conflict divorce that took five years to resolve the custody. And after that's resolved, then your kids soon after want to come live with you. And you're there trying to say, okay, well, are you sure this is what you want to do? I'm not encouraging it. Your mother's important. She is who she is. What's going on? And you know the answer, but you're you're trying not to steer them to, to discard a parent because every parent's important, even though I know deep down they belong with me, they're better raised with me, and they've turned out to be these two young women. So here we are 10 years later, I've got a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old daughter, and they've spent so much time with me having influence with my mother, who has benefited from being able to interact with her only two granddaughters. Her her other child is dead. She has no, she has no other person that can give her kids other than me. So she's got two grandkids and she teaches them everything. She helps them. She disciplines them. And they have developed into tremendous young women. And one thing that I try and do is teach them. And to get to the next part of this, once you have your your high conflict divorce end is say, how can I, how can I be better? And what do we do as as men and as lawyers and educated people to learn from an experience? So what I've started doing is kind of going away from the personal injury practice. And I'm now doing a little bit of family law and the family law I've geared towards men. I started a, a company called men United TV and there's a website you can check it out. But what we try and do is educate men when they're young, because a lot of men, my age, you know, we're middle age, we're forties, we're fifties. We're mad at women because we got divorced and we're just getting older and nobody likes to get older and you don't want to be bitter. But a lot of men, my age, The response is, well, don't talk to women, don't date women, tell your kids not to get married because of what it costs and and what can happen. Here's my lesson. And unlike now where you can go on this channel, you can go all over the Internet, you can find angry men who've been through divorces who I would challenge aren't as bad as mine and aren't as heartbreaking, financially destructive and isolating as mine was. But they're there talking about them, which is great. But the advice they always give is, son, don't get married, don't cohabitate with women, and stay to yourself. There's, you know, the the Mingtao movement, men going their own way. You got this red pill knowledge and these books that men write. And, um, you know, I'd be the first to admit I was a total simp in terms of women because I just assumed I'm this wonderful guy and they're all going to want to be around me. And there's no way any of them would do anything bad to me or take advantage of me as long as I was a good husband and a good man and all those things that you think you're supposed to be, but you learn it, but that doesn't mean you now hate women and you go against women. And you, if you have a son, teach him not to get married because I'm, I'm a big believer in family. I'm a big believer in country. And if you're out there and you're, you're dealing with this, you know, what's going on in the United States of America. The, the, a lot of our population is decreasing. We're not reproducing. We're turning into, 
places like South Africa, Mexico, not what we want to live in, in terms of who we are and what we built. But when we're going through high conflict divorces, we're not supposed to tell our kids, uh, don't get married, don't have families. We want the United States to be strong. We want it to be full of producers. So even if your marriage went bad and we're kind of in transition generations where we go from our parents who are the 40s and the 50s who mostly stayed married and maybe they weren't always happy, but they stayed together because that's how they were raised and they didn't have the temptations we do now with social media and dating apps. But now that that's changed and people are getting divorced quicker, it's going to be the downfall of our society unless we teach uh, young men and even young women, how to be in a family and how to treat a partner correctly and how to find the right partner. So what we do at menunited.tv is we try and do seminars with young men. I like to get in front of, you know, men 18 to 25 who are finding their way in college, who, you know, fall in love differently every day and are still men and still like to date women. And they're still trying to find a wife and they're still trying to have a family. What to do? Because our generation, uh, Generation X kind of get your college degree, build your work, build your career, then get married. And you start getting married when you're 30, if you're lucky to find someone. Then 30 turns into 35, 35 turns into 40. And it's women doing the same thing. They're having to scramble because if they want kids, it's a, it's a rough age to do it. It's not the most healthiest time. You have a lot of disadvantages, just like men do, because as men get older and they wait, they've built their business, they've earned their money, and if they marry the wrong woman, they're going to have what happened to me. They're going to get financially destroyed, even though they're a good man, because the wife has options, the wife doesn't want to be committed to you for whatever reason. So you have no say in the matter when someone says they want to leave. It's no fault divorce. She doesn't have to say why, or uh, if you don't get along and, and you decide to leave to save your your, your damage on your money, she still gets money and she can play the victim easier. So you're, you're at a real disadvantage waiting later to marry, not only from a physical standpoint, but from a financial standpoint. So I've kind of taken the position, you know, teaching men and young women, if you meet the right person, don't be afraid to get married young. And if you get married young as a man, you're going to be taught X, Y, and Z as to what to do to protect yourself legally, financially, emotionally, if the day comes where divorce happens. And the divorce rate isn't likely to go down. The, the marriage rate might, but the divorce rate's not going down. So even though that's happening, you know, you can get in a car accident, doesn't mean you don't drive a car. Um, you still need to get married and you still need to have a family if that's what you want to do. And again, if you're one of those people that doesn't want to have kids and you're fine by yourself, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you meet people like that, you say, do not ever get married. If you don't want children, do not ever get married. So if you are a person, and most people are, most men are, uh, most men want to get married. They want to have kids for a variety of different reasons. Um, you know, pass on lineage, legacy, family, whatever it is, it's because their parents did it. You do it. That's just part of who we are as a, as a human culture. But if you're a man and you're hearing all these stories about high conflict divorce and all the things that are happening, you saw it happen to your father and he's now penniless while the mom lives in the big house, you're discouraged. So you often need someone kind of outside who can give you real advice on here's what you do and here's how you navigate it legally. I wish I would have had it when I was getting married because I would have done so much different. I still would have gotten married knowing what I know, but I would have done a lot of things different to protect myself. And, you know, as a lawyer, you think, oh, you should know all that, but you don't. Uh, and there was nobody out there to give me that advice. You know, I'm someone who kind of keeps to myself for the most part. I don't have a whole lot of friends. And, and you find that when you get divorced, your friends that are married don't want anything to do with you. So if they're married and you bring up the word divorce, you're, you're like talking a foreign language. They don't want to hear about it because it's negative because they're never going to get divorced because they're going to stay married because that's just who they think they are. So your friendships are, are tested and, and you have to get information somewhere from someone who's been through it but you have to get it from someone who isn't going to be bitter about it or someone who hates women. So the, so the thing we do now is we give consults to young men. We talk in groups, we go to schools, we do things where you can sit down with young men and just basically educate them without discouraging them from having families or maybe uplift them because they've got a father at home who's divorced from the mom or a father they don't see because Mom took the kids and ran off and told them a lie that, that daddy didn't want to see you or daddy doesn't pay your child support, 
all the things that isolate a, a young man from a father and and turn them into wimpy men raised by women who it's not for their benefit to be to be grown like that men need their men need their fathers just as young women do and being the father of daughters while you teach them different things you teach them how to be good women you teach them how to protect what their their value is and be careful in the men they choose and if they choose a man they've got a good man don't move on to another guy because he's a little better looking or makes a little more money treat the man you choose with respect work on your relationship communicate be a good wife you know go to church do things that that your grandparents did that maybe you don't do so much now because the the churches are going away people aren't going and and all those things that you need to instill in your daughter so when they do pick a man and and those girls will have lots of options because of just how they look and how smart they are and all the things that I've raised them to be the biggest mistake they can make is pick the wrong man because if you pick the wrong spouse you are ruined in so many ways. So I have to teach my daughters that. So hopefully they will make a good choice, but also know that their father is going to be on them to make sure they make the right choice. Whereas you can meet young men, whether it be through coaching sports, uh, which I do, or schools, or just people you meet randomly, young men that walk into the law office and have one issue and you try to engage them in conversation about their life. And you can get them real interested on on things that you wish you would have been taught about. So what we do now is, is make sure that here you're going to learn how this works and why it might make sense to get married when you're young. Talk about waiting. If that's something you want to do, does it make sense? But ultimately, it's to change the narrative on, on relationships and, and make sure that we are getting married and building our culture, building our society, because things are going to go bad. But as they go bad in these high-conflict divorces, a lot of them wouldn't happen if the parse if if you agreed on equal custody of the kids. The money that I would have saved fighting if I would have been allowed equal custody of my kids. I didn't want to take the kids away from the mom. I didn't want them not to see her. And I've always encouraged them to be in their mother's life and stated how important the mother is. But when you have a a, a spouse that says, Oh, well, because you left or whatever reason, or I just don't even think you're worth anything, I want you to see your kids two days a month. Or, oh, well, now I'm in a good mood. I'll let you see him every other weekend. You're not a man if you agree to that. And even if you have a lawyer that says, oh, well, that's the best you're going to get in court, you don't take that. You, you go to court, you fight it, you get the right lawyer, you walk in there, and you make the judge tell you that you're not worthy of equal custody of your kids because your kids need to see you fighting for them. And it's going to be a high-conflict divorce, and you're going to fight over money, and you're going to have to make a lot of economic decisions. But once you go through that experience, you don't pass on your experience to say, oh, well, don't interact with women. Don't get married. Uh, they're just horrible people. They're all individuals. But what you have to learn is how to spot the bad, just like anything. And you have to learn, okay, well, when does it make sense to get married if I meet the right person rather than say, oh, well, we're too young. I'm not going to get married. I've got to get my degree or I've got to go build this or build that. You need to recognize when you've met the right person. If you meet the right person when you're 22, there's nothing wrong with getting married. It might be a financial struggle, and it's not always fun to have your kids young because I talked to my mom and maybe not so much my dad before he died, but it was a real financial struggle for them to raise two young kids in their early 20s. But that's what everybody did. And yes, society's changed, but if you have the right partner and you have the most enthusiasm when you do, we're teaching these young men now not to walk away from that. Don't be afraid to do it and, and have good communication. And also be respectful of your in-laws and their grandparents and everybody that's on the family on both sides and try and make sure you can get along with them because they will be involved with your children, which will be helpful to their development. But they can also be babysitters, which pre-babysitting, whatever it is, and they get to spend time with your, your, your parents. It's a win-win. Because there are so many parents and grandparents that have been isolated from their children because a spouse has used the court system to keep it that way, or a child behaves in a certain way that won't let his own mother or father see their child, and the grandparents are kept out. And at least in North Carolina, grandparents have very little rights, and it would break my heart to see my mother not to get to see her two grandkids because the wife says, oh, well, you shouldn't be able to see them, or I don't want you riding in a car with them even though there's nothing wrong with her. Yet she's going into court saying, oh, well, I don't want them to see their father more than so many days per month. That's heart-wrenching. 
And it's made even tougher when the average person doesn't have the money it takes to spend on lawyers to fight. And you get in a hole where you're being destroyed financially. You don't have the money to spend anymore. You throw your hands up in the air. You agree to an every other weekend custody. And once you lock in a custody schedule, it is very hard to change. So you think, oh, I'll just come back in a couple of years and I'll get them back with me equal time. It's going to be much harder that second time around than it was when they're making that initial determination. And ultimately, what changed the custody from equal for me to the girls living with me is the girls wanting to go into the courtroom and saying, we prefer to live with our father. It's not dad going into court, bashing the mom some more or saying, I'm the greatest guy in the world. Nothing that either one of us could have done would have changed the custody arrangement after it finally got put in place. Absent the girls walking in there after they reach a certain age and say, here's why we want to move. And the judge pulls them in the back and talks to them. I don't have any idea what was said. And I mean, I even tried to discourage it when they were trying to do it, but I also understood it. And I also knew it was in their best interest. So I let them say what they wanted to say. The judge was going to say what he wanted to say. And here we are. So where I stand now is I have full custody of my two daughters for the most part. Obviously, you still see their mom. She's involved in their life, but um, they're with me every week of school and I help them with everything. And, and they are being raised right. And I don't think a lot of positive about a whole lot, but those two, those two kids are the best thing in my life and my most proudest accomplishment. But if you don't, if you don't handle things correctly or you don't have financial advantages that fortunately I have that a lot of men don't have and you marry the wrong person or at the wrong time, or you don't prepare, you will lose access to your children and you will lose access to what little money you have. So my lesson from all of this, and it will be the same lesson every young man is, and if you're a parent of a young man, pay for a consultation with a divorce lawyer for your young man before he gets married. So if your young man brings home or your son brings home a daughter or a, I mean a, a girlfriend says, I want to get married to her, and you're trying to figure out, you make him sit down with a lawyer, that couple hundred dollar consultation fee, whatever it is, or you maybe know a lawyer that a friend of the family will do it for free. You sit down and you get that lesson. Because I got that lesson from a, a lawyer and that I didn't even know that I was referred to. He spent two hours with me and broke it all down for me. And I'm 43 years old at the time. And that's a wake up call. And you're learning things that you can undo or can't fix. You now have been told what your mistakes are. And you've been told what's going to happen. You now know the system, but you can't change it. Whereas if you get the advice when you're younger, you can navigate a path and any marriage is going to be difficult. And there's still at least a 50 percent chance you're going to get divorced. But there's so many things that can be discussed as to why it's an advantage to get married if you meet someone that you think is the right person and to teach yourself to be open to it if that's what you want to do. And that's for another video and that's for another conversation. But high conflict divorces are going to be there. Uh, for the reasons I discussed, but one thing we want to try and do, and one thing I like to do in terms of speaking to people, um, especially to young men, is give an alternative because the, there's a there's a real wave of angry men and men who go through what I've gone through, telling their sons or any man they know, don't get married, don't have kids, and that's not good for our country, that's not good for our culture, and it's not good for the young man who deserves to experience what you had a chance to experience and failed at because I failed at it. And I certainly bear some responsibility for it. And there's a lot of things that I would do over again. And while I don't think I had anything to do with a high conflict divorce, when you get divorced from someone and you have little kids and there's money on the line, it's going to be high conflict. It's made worse when someone uses the kids as pawns to, you know, either try and get money or get back at you because you wouldn't tolerate certain behavior that makes it worse, but you get put in these high conflict situations over kids and and there's lots of other things that happen. And again, it's for other videos, but some states have alienation of affection laws. So if your partner cheats on you and you're trying to figure out who that person was, can you sue them? North Carolina is a state that still allows it. So that creates even more high conflict. And some states, if you can catch the partner cheating, they don't get the alimony. So that creates more conflict. But these are things you have to educate yourself about. So as you navigate your divorce, navigate your marriage, you become aware of it. You can get your evidence and you can prepare while it's going on rather than trying to get it after you realize, oh, the divorce is happening. We've already told each other to shove off. 
and we're we're trying to to get a good result for ourselves with evidence that we're never going to get because she's gone to see a lawyer. Her lawyers told her what to do. She's hiding things, and she stopped seeing the man she was seeing, and she knows how to have two cell phones. All those things that that you're never going to get now that if you'd have been smart to look out for him while you were married and still in the same household, you would have saved some money. So the point of this video is understand what high conflict divorce is. If you're going to be in a marriage, understand the path you're walking down. And if you're a young person, keep watching all the videos you can on YouTube. It's really a, a great time to, to be alive from an information standpoint. Sometimes it can be overkill and you have to sort through all the stupid stuff and you you see the negativity that comes with women having more access to so many more men and trying to keep a marriage together. Um, you just have to, to see it and watch it. But as you run into these men that have gone through it that are telling you, don't get married, here's my sob story, try and look for some alternatives because young men, you need to get married. You need to have a family if you want children. But you don't do it blindly. You don't go through it like I did, totally naive, educated in the legal community, but really totally naive, yet also a simp because my mom and dad stayed married for 40 years and my father never talked to me about, well, here's the nature of women or here's what they're going to do or here's what you have to watch out for. You get it from experience and you have lots of negative experience. Then you realize I'm not getting any better looking as I get older and I'm not I'm not my peak at 35, yet I still want a family. Why hasn't it happened? And then you make some decisions maybe you shouldn't have made, or you feel like God blessed you, and then you didn't work on it the way you should have. So you end up from not being educated to having to go through high conflict when maybe you could have prepared for it better or handled it better. But once it's over, you have to do the best you can to raise your children and be in their lives. And, and men, that if you're going through divorce right now and she's not letting you see the kids, maybe money's a little tight, the best advice I ever give to men that are going through it is you fight tooth and nail. You don't take every other weekend. You don't let her dictate custody that it's anything less than equal. And I don't care if you've got the best lawyer in the world and that lawyer tells you that in this county, you're not going to get equal. You show your kids what kind of man you are, you walk into that courtroom and you say, judge, if I don't get equal custody of my kids, I want you to tell me that. And you tell me why. And if the judge does that, and you got to remember those judges are rubber stamping everything. Most of them are anti-men. They don't care. They think that the women should be with the mother. And luckily that's starting to change. Um, some states are doing away with alimony, at least around here. You know, whereas 10 years ago, judges that wouldn't give equal custody to men, they're now starting to to do it more regularly. So a lot of it's county, state oriented, you get the wrong judge, you just have to be careful. But I don't care who your judge is, what county you're in, what state you're in. As a man, you do not ever take less than equal custody of your kids. And you do what you have to do just so they're in your life because they will see you fought for them and they will build a good relationship with you versus if you just give up because it's frustrating. And I know it is, you just give up and you let the woman dictate it because women are ruthless. They know the divorce laws the day after you married them, the day before you married them. And you'd be surprised at how many of them are plotting the divorce the, the day that, that you get married. And they're trying to figure out how much you're making, how you're saving your money. How can I get the most out of this guy? They're relentless and they know the divorce laws. The men do not. And even when the man gets fed up and decides to leave and he gets a lesson on what divorce is and what child custody is and how it's all geared towards the woman, it is a kick in the teeth. Even the most educated, street smart guy who deals with all types of people, you get a lesson. So once you have that lesson, you learn from it and you move forward. And I feel like I'm in a position to where I've got that experience. And the, to be able to tell my story in more detail would be books, videos forever. I can, I can literally do YouTube videos forever on my own story. And it's gotten to the point where I can do 20, 30 minutes of stand up at a comedy club about it because it's funny in terms of what happened. It's, it's sad, but you, you, you can talk about it because there's so much that went on, but you don't want to have to do that. You want to learn at a young age. Uh, here's what marriage is. Here's how you navigate it. You get married to prepare for divorce, but you also act like a man that wants to keep his marriage together forever. 
and you treat your wife with respect, you raise your children right, but you don't be afraid to walk away if you're tolerate if you don't tolerate disrespect or your wife's unfaithful or whatever it is. You don't stay in a bad marriage. You don't stay with someone who disrespects you when you're being a respectful man because that's how you get in trouble financially because it would have been harder for me to get divorced now and what it would cost me versus what it would what it cost me 10 years ago and it cost me a lot. I mean a lot. And now I, I couldn't even fathom. And as you get older and your your physicality goes down and you're worn out, you don't want to get what's called a gray divorce. You don't want to be 55 years old, being married 20, 25 years, getting divorced. Maybe you got some teenage kids you're going to have to pay some alimony for. If you're in the wrong state, you're going to have to pay for their college. Luckily, North Carolina is a good state. Once they turn 18 or get out of high school, that's it. But some states, you're paying for college for them. And you're at the older age and you've spent your whole life working, saving, doing all the right things. And now your wife gets the benefit of what you've earned and you're paying out and you're destroyed mentally because women, women are stronger than men in relationships. When you break up with a woman, she forgets you in five minutes. You don't ever forget her if you truly cared about her and you probably still love her and you always will, no matter how bad she treated you. Uh, but she's on to the next guy in five minutes. She doesn't care. She's about the money, what she's going to get. How can I destroy the man if I felt like I was wrong? And how can I keep his kids from him? So what I try to do in, in my job now and, and going forward is to put myself in front of young men that we can teach them, get married, have a wife, have a family, do all the things that your father and your mother did. But here's how you prep for the negative. Here's what you've got to look out for. And here's how you act as a man. And here's how you behave. And, and you need to act right so the woman will want to stay with you and respect you. And if she's not the kind of woman who values her husband because you're good and she's taking advantage of you, this is how you leave. This is what you do. This is how you prepare yourself. So um, I hope everybody out there who's dealing with child custody issues, you're sitting in a marriage deciding what to do, get advice. Don't sit and do nothing because the longer you wait, the worse it's going to be and get help get conversation with people who've been through it um obviously people can email me or contact me and we stay pretty busy talking to mostly young men but um i have many conversations with women that are married and and stuck in bad marriages and they often are in a way where you know they're financially dependent on the man and the man's not doing right either so it's not always one-sided but you have to be ready mostly as a man because the divorce if it's going to happen 50% chance at it. So you don't not do it because no matter what goes on the rest of my life, those two daughters I have and how they've raised and how they've turned out, you couldn't put a price tag on it. And I'm very tight with them, very good relationship with them. They come to me and talk about everything. We talk openly about stuff and that is, that is priceless. And those of you that have that know how valuable that is. And those of you that are chasing it or maybe don't have it because your, your spouse has tried to alienate your kids from you um keep fighting stay in it um fight till the end always try to talk to your kids and be a quality human being but while you're doing all those things educate yourself on the law educate yourself on female nature educate yourself on things you need to learn about and don't be afraid to get married when you're young build a family build a life build your build your your family your your country um your god all those things because we've lost it and it's going away and when these bad things happen, we can make them happen less by educating ourselves, but we need to get away from the negativity that says, okay, now that it's happened to me, son, you don't ever get married, don't have a family. And that's what a lot of men in my position, in my age are doing, which I disagree with. So we try to offer an alternative and just get people in front of young men. So everybody out there, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the video. Um, best of luck and see you soon and enjoy your family. In our next episode of Families Divided TV, Dr. Kelly Baker discusses case management models for contact refusal.